for everyone joining. We will start the webcast in about three minutes. All right, everyone, it is top of the hour. So we do have a lot of things to cover today. So we'll go ahead and get started. Before I hand it over to our presenters, just a few announcements for you. This webcast is not for CPE credit. If you do have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box located on your menu bar, or you can use the chat feature. We may not be able to get to all of the questions today, but we will pull a report at the end of the session and we will answer all of your questions offline. So once again, you can ask any questions through the Q&A on the menu bar, or you can use the chat feature. All right, let's go ahead and turn this over to our presenters. Deb, if you click on the screen, you can get started. Great, thank you. Hello and thanks for joining us today. My name is Deb Nelson. I'm the partner in charge of nonprofit at I Bailey. And today we are hosting the COVID-19 Nonprofit Industry Town Hall webinar. We requested that you send in questions um, as part of the registration process. Um, and we have gone through those questions and categorized them into the various categories. Um, as you can see here on this slide. And while we're not able to address all of the questions that were asked, um, our town hall forum today will provide the opportunity for our experts to address your most pressing questions, those that we saw come up most frequently. And I am pleased to introduce um, our experts for today. So I will be joined by Kim Hunwardson, partner in charge of exempt organization tax and part of our national tax office. Christine Perez is a manager in our national tax office and works closely with Kim on tax exempt issues for the firm. Mel Schwarz is our director of legislative affairs out of Washington, DC. And Angie Hillstead is a partner in our national assurance office. All of these individuals have spent countless hours over the last several weeks staying up to date on the legislation and are here to share their expertise. So with that, um, Kim, I'm going to ask you to touch on this question. So many of the provisions rely on whether an organization has a certain number of employees. Is the calculation of employees the same for all of the provisions that we'll talk about today? Well, Deb, it would seem like that would make life a lot easier if that was the case. And um, as with most things in legislation, uh, things aren't easy. So 
No, unfortunately, the definition of employee or even how you measure um, the number of employees that an organization has is different uh, depending on the provision. So to start off, um, the first piece of legislation we had was the Families First Act, and that applies to organizations that have 500 employees or less. Um, and in this case, we are looking at full and part-time employees that the organization has at the time that that leave is taken. There are some integrated employer tests that need to be considered when you're looking at um, the number of employers under this provision. Um, and if you have joint employees, so you're, you've got someone who works for your organization and another organization, those employees would also be considered in your numbers. The Paycheck, Protect, Paycheck Protection Program um, also applies to organizations with 500 or fewer employees. Um, in this case, it's 500 employees. There's also some size standards um, depending on the certain types of industries you're in, which can allow you to have larger numbers of employees and still meet this small business definition. For most nonprofits, um, when you look at those standards, it's still gonna stay at that 500 employees. However, um, there was an alternative standard that was put in place right before these loans went live um, that also allows an organization that has more than 500 employees to, to apply for the loans if their net worth is less than 15 million and their average net income over the last two years is less than 5 million. Um, it's a little bit unclear whether those affiliation rules are intended to apply to nonprofits, um, but we are aware that there have been some organizations who were able to get loans that had more than 500 employees because they could rely on that alternative. Um, and again, this also, there's some affiliation rules that apply in the um, Paycheck Protection Program. The Employee Retention Credit that we'll talk about a little bit later, that looks at 100 employees um, for purposes of which compensation gets included, and that's looking at your full-time employees. Again, controlled group rules can come into play. And then there's some mid-sized business rules that are looking at 500 to 10,000 employees. And in that case, we're not sure how that's being measured. And we're not sure if there's gonna be affiliation rules. And it's likely that that 10,000 limit could actually go up higher because of some revenue uh, limitations that may or may not, not be put into place. So I guess the answer here is no, everything's a little bit different when it comes to that number of employees. Thank you, Kim. So we did receive a fair number of questions related to the Paycheck Protection Plan. Um, Christine that I introduced has spent a lot of time staying up on this piece of legislation. So Christine, can you remind us which nonprofits are eligible for this program? Yes. Um, so Deb, kind of we'll preface this um, question and answer with the fact that, you know, there was $349 billion um, allocated by that SBA 7A PPP loan program. And we're waiting to see if legislation in Washington will fund a second round. Um, Mel's gonna talk about that a little bit, um, but I know there are a lot of clients still out there that are wondering, am I still eligible? Um, and should I complete an application? Um, so at this time, you know, you do want to go through these eligibility requirements um, to make sure that you do apply. Um, kind of a three-part answer for eligibility, really. Um, so first, the CARES Act did place some limitations on nonprofit organizations that can apply. Um, and the eligibility is limited to 501c3 organizations and 501c19 organizations at this time. Um, governmental entities are not eligible for the PPP loans at this time. Um, and neither are uh, entity types that fall out of that C3 or C19. So unfortunately, our um, 501C6s, 501C7 entities are not eligible for the PPP loan program. Um, kind of the second part test, Kim mentioned this, um, eligibility requirements dependent on size. 
So really 500 or fewer employees, unless the organization can meet either the industry size standards um, or those alternative size standards that were um, brought up in the interim guidance uh, by the SBA and the Treasury. And lastly, um, the third piece is kind of a, a time factor. So all of the organizations eligible for the PPP loans did have to be in operation as of February 15th of 2020. Um, and that meant being in operation and having uh, both salaries and payroll taxes paid at that time. Great, thank you, Christine. Um, this is another question we saw come up quite frequently. So I've applied for the PPP, was approved, and have received the loan proceeds. When does my eight-week period start for the forgiveness? Yes, this is a great question. Um, so that eight-week period, um, or the covered period, as you know, it's referred to a lot of the time, um, it begins on the date that your lender makes the first disbursement um, of the PPP loan proceeds. Now, those proceeds and the disbursement um, should be made no later than 10 days from the date of the loan approval. So pretty quick for that funding. And Deb, I think you might be muted again. I am, thank you. I have a garbage truck going by, so <laughs> real life. If payroll is incurred within the eight week covered period, but paid out in the ninth week, do these expenses count towards forgiveness? And Christine, I think we saw this come up a lot too, which is really getting at the cash mm -hmm. versus accrual process for how we're accounting for these expenses. It really is. So there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of speculation um, on this question. And right now we don't formally know the answer. Um, so we're expecting that some additional guidance will be released by the SBA and the Treasury um, in the coming weeks. But right now the guidance really indicates that costs incurred and payments made um, within this eight week covered period are going to be forgiven. Um, so we've got people that are interpreting this as, you know, cash payments. Um, is it whatever is paid out in cash during this eight week period? Um, is it whatever is paid out and also incurred during the period? Or is it a pure accru accrual basis? Um, so lots of interpretation, lots of speculation. Um, we don't exactly know where the SBA will land on this. Um, a conservative approach right now for planning purposes um, would be to perhaps look at pure accrual, but again, it's really kind of a, you know, we don't know what the firm answer is going to be on this until we receive some additional guidance from um, the SBA to say, you know, what that cost incurred in payments made clause or statement actually means. Okay. So yes, unfortunately, we don't have a better response at this time. I know it is a very common question. So this is probably the million dollar question. How can I maximize the forgiveness of my PPP loan? Can you talk us through what we need to be considering at this point? Yes, um, so right now the SBA and the Treasury have released um, some interim guidance. And we know that the loan forgiveness provision is really the primary reason that a lot of organizations have found this so attractive. So now the big question is, you know, what do I need to do to ensure loan forgiveness? Um, so there are still a lot of questions and speculation on exactly how this calculation will work. Um, but we do know that there are kind of three primary pieces um, to this forgiveness calculation um, that will be looked at to determine what your level of loan forgiveness is. Um, so the first one um, is that 75% payroll um, cost piece. So right now, the guidance indicates that an organization needs to have 75% or more of these PPP loan proceeds used to pay for eligible payroll costs. 25% or less of these expenditures can be used for things like mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. At this time, we don't know if that's a hard cutoff. Um, so we don't know if you hit 74% of payroll, if that's it, it's no forgiveness. Um, all we know is that this factors into the forgiveness calculation um, and that it's going to impact or reduce the forgiveness if you don't meet um, these provisions. The second um, 
provision is to maintain your FTE count um, for the organization. And there are several time periods that this is going to be looked at against. And the big question that people are really asking is, what is an FTE? So right now, that's another item where there's just not clear guidance. Um, so in the past, you know, we've got some historical information that indicates that the SBA has treated an FTE as 30 hours per week. Um, meaning that, you know, if you have two people at 15 hours per week, they would count as one full-time equivalent. Um, if you have someone who works for more um, than those hours, say a 50 hour a week employee, we are making the assumption here that that person would be one FTE. But as to what one FTE will be for loan forgiveness, we don't actually know at this time um, what it will be and we're waiting for additional guidance. So the third um, piece for forgiveness is going to be to maintain um, the salaries of your employees um, at at least 75% of their normal um, pay during the eight week period. So all three of these pieces, you know, um, the 75% of payroll of, for the loan proceeds, maintaining the FTEs and maintaining that salary base for your employees, all of these items are going to impact or reduce that forgiveness. Um, if you do everything perfectly, you know, you're looking at 100%. Um, so a lot of organizations are saying, what can I do to make sure I meet these guidelines? So it's really, can you do some planning up front right now? Um, a lot of people are at iBailey right now, we're doing a lot of planning um, and modeling for our clients to say, you know, this is what we do know, you know, let's run numbers and see um, if you can meet these standards or do you need to bring on more employees. Um, we also know that at the end of the eight week period, you're going to need to submit an application um, for the loan forgiveness. And so you need to make sure that your documentation is in order. So employers right now really can be getting everything in order, doing some planning, taking a look at some of these calculations to make sure that they're going to meet that 75% of payroll um, and those proposed FTE numbers. Thank you. So the PPP requires laid off or furloughed workers to be recalled by June 30, 2020. Is there a minimum period that those workers must be retained? Yes, so um, right now, the SBA materials and kind of everything that you see out there for some guidance kind of makes that statement like rehire quickly. Um, but the statute is actually silent on how long um, a laid off or furloughed worker needs to be recalled for. So we don't have an exact time for how long someone should be brought back on to the payroll or remain on the payroll. Um, we do know that if you bring on an employee by June 30th, um, there should not be penalties um, for doing that. Um, one of the main things that we need to point out with that PPP loan um, is that the purpose really is to keep people employed. Um, and that those proceeds are to be used to help employers pay their payroll costs. Um, so, you know, bringing on people at 630, that might not help with those forgiveness loan calculations. So it really is a case on an organization by organization basis. Do you need to bring these people on now? Do you need to bring them on sooner rather than later in order to meet those kind of three factors for the PPP loan forgiveness tests? Okay, thank you, Christine. Yes. So how are the economic injury disaster loans through the SBA different than the PPP program that Christine just went over? Um, I actually can speak to this one. So these loans, the EIDL or EIDL loans, are low interest loans that provide an upfront advance of up to $10,000. Uh, the SBA defines eligibility as private nonprofits and C-19 organizations. So this classification is much broader than what we see within the PPP program. So if you're exempt under 501C, such as a C-4, C-6, or C-7, this program is available to you. Um, government entities, however, at this time are not included in this. Um, these loans are available to both small and large employers. 
Um, the big piece to remember and what sets this program apart from the PPP is it is not a forgivable loan. Um, so it does have a higher interest rate at 2.75% compared to the 1% of the PPP. However, the term of the loan is up to 30 years versus the two years on the PPP program. Um, in addition, these loan proceeds can be used for operating costs beyond what is stipulated for the PPP. Um, so if payroll is not your largest expense, this may be a better option for you to look at. Um, you can apply for both the PPP and the EIDL loans, but the key is to ensure that you have support and are tracking that you are not um, covering the same expenses with both of those loans. Um, if you were lucky enough to receive an advance under this program, um, you're not required to repay that, even if your application is denied or if you end up not actually accepting the loan proceeds. Um, however, if you do have that advance payment, it will be counted towards your loan forgiveness under the PPP. And as Christine mentioned, these programs have had a high demand. I know towards the end of last week, the SBA indicated they are not accepting any new applications and will continue to process um, all of the other applications that were submitted on a first come first serve basis. And we'll get some insight from Mel towards the later part of this program on what we may see happen here in the future. So other than the SBA programs, Kim, can you speak to what other relief provisions are out there for nonprofit organizations? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is really a key area because so much of the attention um, in the media and everywhere has been focused on these SBA programs, which are great. They're great programs for um, organizations, but as we um, are aware, they left a number of organizations out. So um, our non-501c3 organizations are completely excluded from the PPP loans. They are included in the EIDL loans. Um, but there are some other, and then across the board, those five, the employees, employers that have more than 500 employees are also excluded from the PPP loans. So it's leaving a number of organizations kind of feeling like, well, what's in it for me? Where's my opportunities? So we do wanna to touch on a couple of other opportunities that are available to all organizations um, that they're not these forgivable loans. Um, they're not loans in some cases at all, but there are some provisions that can help organizations um, get some relief with respect to uh, the COVID-19. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the employee retention credit. And this credit is available to all organizations. So all types of nonprofits, um, regardless of your employee count, are eligible to take advantage of the employee retention um, credit. Unfortunately, governmental organizations are excluded um, from the employee retention credit. And you're also excluded from taking this credit if you received a loan under the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, so those are a couple of the exclusions to this, but if you are one of those organizations that either chose not to participate in the Paycheck Protection or were not eligible, um, this is something that you can consider. And in order to be eligible for this um, retention credit, the organization needs to be able to show that it's an eligible organization. And those are employers who were either fully or partially suspended um, in their operations due to a related shutdown order, or who had gross receipts that declined by more than 50% when you compare it to the same quarter in your prior year. Um, so, you do have to meet one of those two criteria in order to be eligible. Now, I will say we, do, we don't have a lot of guidance on what does that mean. So, you know, what does it mean to be fully or partially suspended? Um, we've got one example that came out from the IRS that basically indicates that a restaurant who can no longer provide um, in-house service but can only do takeout and drive-through would meet the definition of partially suspended. Seems like a pretty easy um, definition for us to understand, but it's not as easy when you start applying it to facts 
for other organizations. Um, the gross receipts declining by more than 50%. The key thing to know there is that um, you can take this credit for any quarter where your gross receipts fall below that 50%. As soon as your gross receipts are up to 80% of what they were for the prior or for the quarter the year before, then you no longer are eligible for this credit. And the credit is refundable and it's up equal to 50% of the wages that were paid um, up to $10,000 per person for um, 2020. And that does include their health benefits. So effectively your maximum credit per employee is $5,000. Now where um, I mentioned earlier that there was a hundred employee um, wage or hundred employee limit on here and where that comes into place is where you have to look at your eligible wages. So if you're an employer that has more than 100 full-time employees, the eligible wages that you can look at and include in this credit are only wages that you pay to employees when they are not providing services. So in other words, you're continuing to pay someone even though they aren't currently working. If, you're, if you have less than 100 full-time employees, then all employee wages can be um, eligible for the credit, regardless of whether um, the employee is working or not. And this credit, these credits will apply to wages paid after March 12th and before January 1st of 2021. So effectively from March 12th until the end of the year. So that's, that is a good um, opportunity if you don't have that Paycheck Protection Program loan. The next opportunity is um, the opportunity to defer payroll taxes. So this provision allows employers to defer payment of your employer share of social security taxes. So that's the 6.2% on your employee wages. Um, this provision again applies to all employers and there's no limit on the number of employees in order to take the deferral. Um, what ends up happening on this is that you can defer your taxes um, that are paid from March 27th through the end of the year with one half of that amount being paid in 2021, so December 31st, 2021. The other half is due December 31st, 2022. So key thing to keep in mind here is this isn't a reduction in your taxes, so you're still going to have to pay these taxes it's just a cash flow deferral. Um, interaction of this with other provisions is that you can't defer your taxes if you have your Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiven. So that is potentially going to cause some question as to, well, if I can start deferring taxes the end of March, but I may not know until sometime late summer, um, whether my, my loan is actually forgiven. Um, we did get some questions, frequently asked questions last week that indicates that during um, the time period from the end of March until you receive notice that your loan is forgiven, you can defer your payroll taxes. Once you receive notice that your loan has been forgiven, then at that point you have to stop deferring the payroll taxes but the amount that had been deferred is still eligible to be deferred until the end of 21 and end of 22. Um, so that was good for us to get that information because that was a question that was out there. And then the last piece of opportunity that's out there um, is with respect to some economic stabilization loans. So the act provided $500 billion in funding to assist small businesses, which does include nonprofit organization. And Treasury gave responsibility to, um, or was given responsibility to the Federal Reserve to implement programs to help mid-sized organizations. So these are organizations that have from 500 to 10,000 employees. 
Um, these loans are not forgivable. So they're different than the paycheck protection loans in that they're not forgivable. Um, we, at this point, we're not sure what the interest rate will be. Um, the, there's some difference right now in, we just got some guidelines um, end of last week or the beginning of last week with respect to at least the first rollout of what, what the Fed is looking at um, through the Main Street Lending Program. And so some term sheets have been released which don't necessarily match up um, line by line with what's actually in the legislation. So the legislation indicated that the interest rates would be no higher than 2%. The term sheets were different than that. Um, the borrowers in the legislation, it was indicated the borrower would need to make some good faith certifications with respect to several terms. Um, again, when you came back to what's in the term sheets, some of those terms weren't in there. Um, so I would say with respect to this, there's still um, additional information that's going to be needed as to how these truly apply, how organizations will get the funding. Um, it sounds like most of these fund, or these funds will be through um, banks, so it won't be something where you would apply to the Federal Reserve. It would actually be done through banks. But I think the key thing to keep in mind here is that um, these are not effectively grants. They're not forgivable, so it will be um, a loan that's required to be paid back. Thank you, Kim. I do think it's important to make sure everyone is aware of those additional programs. Um, so we're going to move into a few questions related to the Families First Act. Um, Mel, do the requirements to provide benefits under this act apply to all employers and all employees? Well, <clears throat> no, it does not. The, uh, the basic rule is the Families First Act mandatory benefits apply to employers with less than 500 employees. Uh, the exception to that are government employers. And government employers are required to provide this under any circumstance without regard to the number of employees that they have. Uh, but for uh, a non-governmental employee, and that includes a non-governmental uh, tax exempt, uh, then this is uh, entirely based upon the number of employees that the, uh, that the employer has. Okay. Get my slides to go here. And what documentation is required in order to um, have that leave provided? Well, it, it's really pretty much the basics. Uh, what you need to do, what you as the employer need to do when your employee requests this leave is you need a piece of paper that said, has the employee's name, the date, or dates for which leave is being requested. And this is both the sick leave and the expanded family leave. It apply to either of these. Uh, the employee's statement that they are unable to work or unable to telework uh, because of a COVID-19 related reason. And the employer is generally allowed to rely on the statement that the employee makes that I am unable to work. And this will particularly, I think, be come a question in the case where the employee is asking for paid leave to care for a child, uh, because that is gonna be where there is a more subjective question as to whether they can effectively work with the children running around, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, being able to, to put them aside or put them in front of the television. Uh, finally, uh, to the extent that the, uh, uh, the request is being made, then the reason for the request needs to be put down on paper. I am being subject to quarantine. I am being subject to uh, isolation. I am taking care of someone who is quarantined or subject to isolation, or I'm taking care of the child. And at least minimal evidence that supports that. If the doctor is saying you need to quarantine, we need the doctor's name. If the if this is to take care of someone else who is quarantined, it would help to have both the doctor's name and the person that you're taking care of. And finally, with regard to children, some indication of why their normal 
childcare is not available. School has been closed. You can take a, uh, again, the goal does not seem to be to require a lot of detail, but really just to lay the basics down. Now, what do you do with this information? Get it in writing and put it in the drawer because the Department of Labor does not want to see it now. The Internal Revenue Service does not want to see it now. Who knows what the level of audit of this is going to be, but at some point, somebody is going to be asked to prove it up. And this is the kind of piece of paper that you're going to want to have if and when you happen to draw that black bean. Great advice, Mel. In regard to leave, can that be taken intermittently or does it need to be taken all at once? Depends on the kind of leave that's being requested. Generally, sick leave needs to be taken all at once. And the idea there is we're trying to, uh, if you're sick, we're trying to keep you out of circulation. And so take your two weeks, take your, your 80 hours and stay home. Uh, for taking care of a child and certainly for taking care of a child when they're asking for, the employee is asking for the expanded family leave, then it can be taken on an intermittent basis. Now, there are two rules that apply to that. If the work is being done on the employer's site, then intermittent leave can be taken, but it has to be on a day-by-day -day basis. In other words, parent one could handle, could, could take leave on days one, three, and five. Parent two could take leave on days two and four. And uh, whether that's the same employer, whether those are two different employers, that is appropriate and that is allowed. If you're talking about telework so that someone is staying at home, but because they need to take care of the children, they cannot really do anything. This can be done apparently as close to as on an hour by hour basis. So the morning, one parent could handle the morning, one parent could handle the afternoon. You could even trade off each time the, the, the clock rang for the hour. Uh, now, one thing needs to be noted here, this is available assuming that the employer and employee agree. The employer is not required to allow intermittent leave, but the employer is urged, at least in the Department of Labor regulations, is urged to do so. Uh, and I think most of, them, most of us will find that uh, this is an acceptable way of dealing with the question, uh, particularly in the childcare incidents. Thank you, Mel. So how will an employer receive the payroll tax credits from the various provisions? So we've heard both Kim and Mel talk about the relief provisions that provide for that refundable payroll tax credit. Um, to claim these credits, employers will report the total qualified wages and the related credits for each calendar quarter on the employment tax returns or your form 941. And because the quarterly 941s are filed after you've paid those qualifying wages, the IRS has a process for being able to claim an advance credit. To do that, you would file Form 7200, Advance Payment of Employer Credits Due to COVID-19, to request that credit. So there's no notification that has to be done um, prior to doing your 941. Everything will be reconciled with your wages and your credits on that 941 filing. And you can receive tax credits for both the qualified leave wages under the Families First that Mel talked about and the employee retention credit, but the credits cannot be for the same wages. And I think that's pretty clear throughout a lot of these provisions is they don't want you to double dip or be able to take advantage of the same program for the same expenses. Now we're going to move into some of the accounting related questions that we received. Um, Angie, will nonprofits that receive federal funds to help with COVID relief under the CARES Act or other similar legislation be subject to a uniform guidance single audit? I know you've gotten this question a lot in the last few weeks. Yes, that's been a, a very common question that we've been fielding and 
Um, one that, you know, I'm going to answer at a pretty high level, um, mostly because next week on Thursday, April 30th, we're holding a specific webcast for that's going to be associated with all, all everything grant related to um, this madness that we're in right now. Um, but, you know, a short answer to that is yes, we do believe based on everything that we've seen, um, you know, at this point that this is going to be treated like any other federal loan or grant that your organization receives. So this means that it will likely go on your schedule of expenditures of federal awards. And if you already have federal awards, you know what that means. Um, and if you don't, it might be something new for you. Um, but essentially what's going to happen is if your total federal expenditures are over $750,000, you will be subject to a uniform guidance single audit. Um, I want to caveat that just a little bit by saying that this is not, this is based on how similar types of programs have been treated in the past. So for example, during the, the last economic downturn, the funding that was provided under ARA was subject to uniform guidance single audit. And there hasn't been anything at this point coming out of Washington DC that leads us to believe that these funds will be any different. So things that we want to really hit home on um, as far as the grant compliance piece that we're going to talk about next week is good. They're going to focus on what you need to do within your organizations to help manage these funds in a way that will allow you to get through that single audit without running into a lot of issues. So how are you tracking your costs? Um, what kind of records do you have in place to show how you've used the funds? Um, what are your internal control considerations? Um, all the things that we as auditors are required to do when we come in and take a look at, at these funds. Um, because again, at this point, we do think that they are going to be subject to those requirements. Thank you. And are there any unique accounting considerations we should be thinking of because of the situation that we're in? Can you maybe touch on a few of those? I know there's probably more than we have time to touch on today. Yeah, there are, there are many more than we have time to touch on today. Um, I do, I will hit on a couple of big ones that we've been talking about internally within our firm. Um, first is how do you record all of these PPP loans that are coming in and the potential grant forgiveness. What does that look like in the financial statements? Um, you know, initially what's gonna happen is these loans will likely fall under contribution guidance, which means um, they, you know, the, the federal government is not providing these to you um, in an exchange transaction. So there's not commensurate value being exchanged, meaning that they are going to be grants um, that fall under contribution guidance. And they're, they're really more than likely conditional contributions um, because there are barriers that you will have to overcome in order to be able to recognize the loan forgiveness. And attached to those barriers, um, you know, are the things that we've talked about already today maintaining your employees, using them for qualified expenses. Um, so what this means is initially when the money comes into you, it's a loan. So it's going to sit in your financial statements as, you know, a deferred revenue or a loan. Um, and then once you've met those requirements uh, to have part of that loan forgiveness, it will move to your statement of activities as a contribution. So it's, you know, one of the questions that we get along with that is when does that happen? Does that happen as I'm paying my employees that I think are going to qualify for forgiveness? Does it happen once the loan has been forgiven? Um, and there really isn't a simple answer to that. Um, it kind of depends, though I think what you will find um, us doing in our profession is really encouraging people to take a step back and say, when did you actually meet the requirement for forgiveness of a loan? Um, at the point in time that the federal government releases you from that obligation, that is likely when those barriers have been overcome. So I think if you're a June 30 year end, what you're likely going to see is a conversation about um, recognizing that forgiveness in fiscal year 2021. Um, always some you know, exceptions to that, but probably what you'll be seeing there. Um, the other question we have gotten is, whether or not that forgiveness is a restricted contribution or a contribution that is without donor restrictions. Um, and 
that's really going to be an accounting policy election. As not-for-profits, one of the things that you are able to do is determine whether you are going to recognize as with donor restrictions or without donor restrictions, um, conditional contributions whose conditions are met um, at the same, in the same time period that the condition or the contribution is provided to you. So you'll want to take a look at your policy and see if you know, your policy says that you initially are going to record that as with donor restrictions and then, um, per, and then show a release from restriction, or if you'll just record it directly to without donor restrictions. So those are a couple of things that are specific to the PPP loan. Um, a couple other things for you to consider as you're getting ready for your audit is that asset values likely are going to look very different in this environment than they did four months ago. So you need to be thinking about the impact to your assets that are on your balance sheet, your statement of financial position. Um, chances are not everything um, is really worth what it was before this mess started. So we need to be thinking about declining asset values during this time period. We need to be thinking about significant estimates and how they should look different now. Um, if you have accounts receivable for program services or promises to give from donors, um, you probably have an established process for determining what your allowance is every year. And that's pretty easy when things look great and don't change a lot. Um, but the financial impacts of COVID-19 are affecting everyone. So if you have um, an asset on your statement of financial position that is dependent on somebody paying you some money, you really need to sit down and think about how that valuation estimate should look different than it has in the past. Um, you know, one other maybe financial reporting consideration that is um, not so pleasant to talk about, not that either of those are, um, are going concern impacts. Um, you know, as auditors, we are required to um, issue our audit opinion over your ability to continue as a going concern from a year past the issuance of the financial statement date. So if you're a June 30 year end and we issue our financial statements on October 28th, we need to have, make sure that that report is clear that we don't believe there's any going concern issues through October 28th of the following year. Um, you know, this evaluation is not going to be pretty this year. There are going to be so many organizations that are impacted operationally. Um, but this is a conversation you will likely be having with your auditors and potentially will have some financial statement disclosures regarding going concern and business operations. Thanks, Angie. Those are great tips to be thinking about. And this next question, will our annual audit process be different this year? I'm guessing the short answer is yes, but I'm hoping you can provide a little more detail for what people should expect. Yeah, I would agree 100%. The short answer is going to be yes. Um, I can say with near certainty, everything is uncertain right now, but with near certainty, I can tell you that things are going to be different in your audit. Um, you know, even if you're a December 31 year end and your audit is done now and you think, well, by next year on December 31, we're gonna be back up and running, so it's going to be fine. Um, things are still going to look different because you have now operated for a period of many weeks and months under different circumstances than you did when you started the year. Um, and that's if we're up and running again, and who knows if that will be the case. Um, I don't know, you know, if you guys are all working in your offices or if you're working from home, but at I Bailey, we've started our sixth week uh, this week of working from home. So our offices have been closed and we're not allowing client field work. So what does that mean? Um, when it comes time to do your audit, will we be able to come out on site? Or will we be trying to figure out how we use Zoom meetings and team meetings and Skype meetings um, to try to make the audit process seamless? Um, if you're an entity that normally has an inventory observation, and we have a lot of not-for-profit clients where we do inventory observations, you know, can we come on site? Is it possible to get into your warehouse? Or are we going to need to be talking about doing something through a Skype feature on an iPad? Um, you know, those are real questions that you should be having with uh, your auditors right now as you're thinking about your audit process. 
You know, another big thing that we know we're going to have to spend some time understanding is how changes in internal controls and processes have been impacted during this time period. Um, even if you were at home all the way through your year end, if you're not at home now, things are different. Things are operating differently. How are, how are you signing checks? How are you paying bills? Who's reconciling accounts receivable? Um, all of that is likely happening in a different manner than it did um, even six weeks ago. So it's going to be a lot of understanding between the auditors and you to figure out kind of where we focus our time and how you made changes um, in order to make sure that your business was as uninterrupted as possible. Um, the last little thing I want to say about, you know, this, this is that likely we're going to be asking for more and different information than we have in the past. Uh, because if we're used to looking over your shoulder while you provide us with a general ledger detail so that we know that, you know, there's no alterations to it, um, we're going to have to find another way to get comfortable with the validity of the data that you've provided. So we're going to be asking probably for copies of things that maybe we haven't asked for before, um, or really just looking at things in a completely different manner um, this year. So really the time, uh, the theme of auditing in this crazy COVID time is that things are going to be different and they should look different. Um, and if your audit team isn't approaching things any different you feel than any other um, time that you've worked with them, I would take a step back and kind of point out to them all the things that you're doing that you know are different than you were doing at the beginning of the year. That is a lot of information to be thinking about and definitely will have an impact for organizations. So Christine, I'm going to direct this one to you um, to talk about what changes were made regarding the charitable contribution deductibility rules. Yes, um, so the CARES Act actually includes um, a couple of different charitable incentives um, that are targeted towards both individuals and corporate donors. Um, I think most of us at this point have heard of this $300 above the line deduction, um, and that's for contributions to public charities um, that are made by uh, non-itemizers on their individual tax return. Um, at this time, we don't have clarification as to whether or not that $300 is um, a deduction that'll be taken per individual, uh, per couple, if it will be per return. So we're hoping to see some additional guidance that clarifies that piece. Um, we also know at this time that there are a lot of nonprofits that are saying that this $300, it's not enough. Um, and so we're waiting to see if some additional guidance passes or if they kind of just redo um, this portion of the CARE Act with separate legislation um, to increase that uh, deduction. Now the cash, con it needs to be a cash contribution, that $300. Um, it needs to go to a public charity and it can't be provided to say a supporting organization, to a donor advised fund or some other type of intermediary. So there are some kind of restrictions there. For those who do not itemize their deductions, um, the CARES Act bumped up and kind of removed those caps. So normally you'd have a, a limit of 60% of AGI. It's been removed up to 100% of AGI for um, those who itemize their deductions. For corporate donors, um, the annual contribution caps were also changed. Um, so those were changed from 10 to 25% of corporate income. And then for corporate donors who make food donations, they changed those cap limits from 15 to 25% of corporate income for the donations. Thank you. It will be interesting to see what, if anything, um, gets modified related to this. Yes, very interesting. Okay, well now to talk about the 990. I know that's near and dear to all of our hearts. Have there been any changes to tax return filing deadlines related to COVID-19 pandemic? Kim, I know you would love to address this yeah, one. I would love to address this. So <laughs> uh, yes, there have been. Um, you know, originally we all, probably knew about the changes that got made to the 1040 filing deadlines, um, where the 1040 payments and returns um, were extended from April 15th to July 15th. 
And when that first um, legislation came out, it did not include um, 990s. It included 990Ts um, that were due, or the payments that were due as of April 15th, uh, but it didn't help us out on 990s, primarily because it's an information return. Um, so much of the extension of time really was looking at giving people an extension of time to have to make payments um, through lots of legis lots of um, lobbying and um, trade organizations saying, you know, this isn't for a lot of our nonprofits. This isn't just about having to pay tax. It's about the amount of time and effort that goes into having to get the um, Form 990 done that really is an impact. And so on April 10th, we did get um, additional legislation that changed um, the tax filing deadlines for all returns that were due from April 1st through July 15th and extended that due date until July 15th. So that does include 990s, 990 PFs, 990 Ts, um, your form 4720 that relates to any kind of excise taxes that you might have to pay. Um, it really across the board says any tax return that's due during that time period now has a due date of July 15th. Um, I know we're talking with our clients. I'm sure most of you are talking with your accounting firms, but to the extent you can get the returns done, um, highly encourage you still to get them done. You know, we might make a recommendation that if you have a payment due, hold that payment or hold that return to July 15th. But if you're in the process of getting your 990 done, um, get it done by the May 15th deadline, just because if you think about it, all tax returns that are due in the country are going to be due um, July 15th. Now, that extension to July 15th does not require us to do any kind of additional request for extension. It's an automatic extension, so no forms need to be filed. However, if you are a calendar year taxpayer, so your return was originally due May 15th, it's now due July 15th, and if you're still not ready to file it at July 15th, then an extension of time will need to be made at July 15th that will give you the normal extension. So it'll extend the return out to the normal um, November 15th deadline. So this was really good news for a lot of organizations um, that are really focusing on just keeping the doors open and keeping and helping people that are in the midst of um, issues with this. So um, we're, we're thankful for that. The other thing I will mention is there's a couple other things that are extended in there. Um, if you're a, an organization, a hospital that had to do a community health needs assessment and that due date was within this time frame, it does get extended out to July 15th. Um, additionally, if you're a new organization or fairly new that's um, looking at the 27 months in getting your exemption application filed for it to be a retroactive exemption, um, that exemption or that date has also been extended. Great, thank you for that insight. And Mel, I'm going to direct this last slide over your way. Um, you know, we're often asked what else is on the horizon for relief. I know many groups are calling for reform to the CARES Act or for additional relief for the sector as a whole. Can you speak to what type of legislation might be coming for nonprofits or, you know, any insights you have in this area? Uh, at this point, <clears throat> the uh, attempt to pull together an additional uh, piece of legislation, uh, which we had hoped would be completed, uh, or at least the deal would be completed by now, uh, still seems to be in negotiation. There is still hope here in Washington that legislation can be passed this week, which would add an additional $370 billion to the, uh, to the two uh, loan provisions that we've been discussing, uh, both the emergency loan and the PPP loan. Uh, in addition to that, we expect there to be some uh, extended payments directly for hospitals uh, and other healthcare type situations, uh, including funding for testing. Uh, 
At this stage, the plan still seems to be if they can reach an agreement by this evening to pass it through the Senate tonight uh, by unanimous consent, and then the House will take it up probably sometime Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening, uh, with the President having at, indicated that he's likely to sign. So we're expecting additional funds for the loan programs. We're expecting some additional funds to address the, co uh, the COVID-19 situation by the end of the week. Uh, how long it will take to actually implement those uh, is not clear. Although to the extent they are simply add-ons to the existing program, perhaps that can be done fairly quickly. With regard to the PPP program, there is some indication that some of the rules may change. Uh, whether that will expand to more tax exempts than the, uh, the, the two groups that are currently uh, allowed uh, is not clear. Uh, but probably the, the issue that you've been seeing in the newspaper about the uh, restaurant chains being able to claim multiple sources uh, despite their sometimes significant size through the PPP program. That one is likely to be addressed. And uh, that at least on a going forward basis, uh, those loans would not be available to those types of taxpayers. Uh, one of the big questions is what happens to applications that were in the pipeline but did not make it far enough into the pipeline to be funded under the old, uh, under the previous amounts. There is some discussion that they, it will be continue to be first come first serve and those will be satisfied, but there is no guarantee of that. Uh, as quickly as we saw the money go with regards to PPP, if <clears throat> you are of a mind to apply for PPP, once we see this additional $370 billion put into the pot, uh, I would not wait to do it because as it went in several days, the first tranche, the second tranche is likely to go fairly quickly as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're very popular programs. And do you have insight on when we might receive additional guidance related to the forgiveness piece on the PPP? That is, um, the IRS and well, uh, small business IRS Department of Labor are issuing additional guidance on a very frequent basis. Sort of when they get to a when they settle on an answer, they tend to go ahead and publish it uh, because forgiveness is something that's going to occur sometime in the future and not tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. There may be less pressure that they feel to get guidance out with regard to that as opposed to guidance that might apply to the actual application process itself. Uh, but I would expect that we will see this uh, <laughs> as, soon, uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Well, we are at our time limit for today. Um, I did want to point out that I Bailey has a dedicated web page for the COVID-19 her visit the site and see the resources that we have available. Um, there's everything from articles to previously recorded webinars that you can seek out. Um, we will continue to provide free webinars on this topic as that additional guidance comes out. Um, so be on the lookout for the information that Angie mentioned regarding the grants webinar that will be taking place next week. And then shortly after today's session, we are doing another webinar that will speak to more details of the PPP. So if that's something of interest to you, you can go out to the iBailey um, webpage, look under events, and you can get registered for that. Um, if you have received PPP funding, we understand that maximizing that forgiveness is top priority. Um, we can help with this process. iBailey has developed a loan forgiveness calculator based on the current guidance that we will adjust as additional guidance comes out. So if you have any questions related to how that might look for your organization, please reach out to your iBailey contact. 
And in addition, we also have a tool that's been developed for the employee retention credit. So if that's something that your organization is interested in, please contact your iBailey team member. And if you're new to iBailey, feel free to reach out to any of the individuals that spoke today. Um, so I'd like to take time to thank all our presenters for their expertise. And I know we did not have time to get to many of the additional questions. So we will take a look through that and try and reach out on any of those. Thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you all for attending and thank you to our presenters and we hope everyone has a great day.